So, you know, what was the one thing that I said I would have the courage to do when I stood up? Uh, it was to speak after Sheryl Sandberg. <laughs> To follow Anne Moore and to follow Sheryl Sandberg on this stage, uh, you better be brave. <laughs> uh, or foolish. Uh, and I'm probably both. But uh, I just want to end by first and foremost uh, saying thank you. As I have spent uh, the last two days here with uh, all of you, I have just been awash with gratitude. It is just one of those moments in which I have felt just deeply grateful to all of you. Uh, the women of Harvard Business School, who are such an extraordinary part of this institution, uh, who I know for many times and for many years have sometimes felt disenfranchised, disconnected, uh, unwelcome at Harvard Business School. Uh, I hope that changes. This, if there is one thing that I hope this event will do, is it will change the relationship that each of you have uh, with this remarkable institution. Uh, because you deserve better and we deserve better. We need you. Uh, we need you to be a part of this institution and we need you to be a part of this institution with all your heart. So I hope that if there's one thing that's a, that this event will do, it's that. So, I need to say a few thank yous, and uh, having said a few thank yous, I'll say a few things that I can promise you as well. Uh, first and foremost, I think it's just fitting that you join me as I offer my personal thanks to so many of my colleagues uh, who have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours uh, planning for this event, making this event happen. Uh, we would never, ever have been able to do it without all of the work that so many of them did. And all of you are leaders, and you know that uh, you know, people like me get a lot of credit, uh, which is absolutely unfair. <laughs> because the real people who actually get anything done uh, are amazing distributed leaders all over the organization. Uh, we've been lucky to have so many of them. I could, it's impossible to name all the people who got this thing done for us. But I'm still going to take a risk, and I'm going to name a few, because I think they just deserve to be named. Uh, I want to thank uh, Robin Neely, uh, Boris Kreuzberg, and Cynthia Montgomery, who were the faculty chairs of the W50 effort. Stephanie Goff, who has been roving around uh, throughout this time and who helps our alumni and our alumni population more broadly connect with each other and with the school. Stephanie. <laughs> when we got this effort started, we realized that if we didn't get some of our own alumni involved in the effort, uh, as co-leaders, uh, Susan Good and Jill Fadul joined us, and uh, they were remarkable. Colleen Ammerman, Kelly Diamond, uh, Jill Fadul, Kalpana Jain, and Laurie Shannon, they did all of the research on the alumni survey, the case, the film, so many pieces of trying to pull this whole thing together. Uh, thank you to them. <laughs> to Kerry Herman and the Global Research Group who worked with Boris in the case study, uh, to the amazing team led by Nancy Baccia and Kelly Salheimer in external relations, Andrew Falzone in operations, 
Hosting 800 people on this campus may look easy, but it isn't an easy matter, and that's what they all managed to get done uh, for us. So please, let's join in giving them. Uh, I also have a couple of uh, important announcements to make. Uh, announcements that I'm actually very proud of. Uh, so one of the things that uh, you have heard repeatedly is there something about Harvard Business School uh, and its physical space, which is really, really important. I, I never understood that. I went to MIT and uh, I had a faculty member who once said to me, you want to understand Harvard Business School? Just go and walk there. Uh, and there's something about being on this campus that just feels like it's hallowed ground, it's special in all these ways. So it's no surprise that when you talk to women, the permanent stories that you first hear are about the ladies' room that had the urinals. <laughs> That's just become like the symbol of you know, how much this place was a man's institution uh, and how it took so many years for us to change that. Uh, so I'm very proud to announce today that you know, we have 37 buildings on our campus. Uh, not one until now is named for a woman. Uh, but this year we got, as part of our W50, an amazing gift, an amazing gift that will have uh, what was formerly Kresge, uh, instead of that building, a new building that will be named for a woman. It will be... <laughs> this building will be called the Ruth Mulan Chu Chow Center. It comes from a family of four women who went to Harvard Business School. The 27th, the 24th Labor Secretary of the United States, uh, former Secretary Elaine Chow, her sister Angela Chow, Grace and May Chow, uh, in honor of their mother, who was this amazing woman who came to this country on a boat, believed from the very first day that success in this country came from having her children get educated at a time when it was absolutely rare to have Asian American women come to graduate schools and business, sent all four of her daughters to this institution. This is what they have done to honor her, and I think those days when we worried about urinals in the women's restroom, I think are over. <laughs> so. A second gift uh, which we got this year, which is uh, equally important. Uh, you heard uh, yesterday in the documentary that it was only in the 1970s that we had the first woman faculty member get tenured through the regular ranks at Harvard Business School. Uh, we are still a far, far way from how many tenured women we need to have uh, on our tenured faculty. But if you think about the chairs at Harvard Business School, and we have lots and lots of chairs at Harvard Business School, we're very fortunate. Our alumni have been very generous. We have only three chairs that are named for women out of the chairs that we have at Harvard Business School. And this year, we got our third chair, the Diane Dorgie Wilson Professor of Business Administration, which is the first chair whose sole purpose is to have as its occupant someone who is committed to the advancement of women in leadership. Uh, this was a gift by one of our own faculty members, Al Silk, and I am terribly, terribly proud today to announce that Robin Ely will be the first occupant of this chair. Finally, one other announcement of a similarly historic nature. Uh, the Women's Students Association at Harvard Business School, uh, I think, has done 
more for this cause than any of us could ever imagine. The more I understand what they have done, the more remarkable it is what they did throughout the years standing up for the role of women at Harvard Business School. Throughout this year, they have celebrated this event in parallel with us and in partnership with the faculty and the administration in their own amazing ways. It's been amazing to see what they have been able to accomplish. Uh, and this year, they took another step of endowing an MBA fellowship at the school. It's the first student gift of this type, uh, and it will create an enduring legacy at Harvard Business School, ensuring that women from a diverse range of backgrounds can attend and thrive in our MBA program. So thank you again to the Women's Student Association. So now as I've been walking around the uh, last two days, uh, I have been perpetually reminded about these, this one feature of her business school that never ceases to amaze me. Uh, it's this comment about uh, the amount of hope, expectation that people have in this institution. So I was, uh, you know, if you remember Nancy Berry, the word that she used in her uh, comments yesterday about uh, the one word that captures her business school, her word was power. Uh, and the influence that this institution has. And what I was realizing is as I walked through, including, you know, Anne Moore pointing at me and saying, Dean, now that, what are you going to do? Uh, you were not the first person pointing at me this entire time. Uh, is that uh, there is somehow this extraordinary expectation that Harvard Business School can change it all. Uh, that, you know, we just snap a finger <laughs> and we're going to have 50% uh, men and women and boards and CEO positions and everything else. I, I was reminded during the, we, we did this project on US competitiveness. Uh, and I kid you not, I mean, the number of times where I had alumni come to me and said, if you would just go to Washington and tell them what you learned about the US Competitiveness Project, uh, they would get it. And I have to remind them, Harvard Business School is powerful. But you know, as any powerful person needs to recognize, uh, with power, you should have humility. It, it's important to remember that humility is a, is a vital character that must go alongside power. And humility should not stop our ambition to try to influence things. But we should still recognize that this is a long fight. Uh, and what I can promise you is that I'm in for the long fight. Why am I in for the long fight? Uh, very simple reason. If I wasn't in, my wife would kill me. <laughs> I, uh, I have a very personal connection to this. I, uh, this is 50 years of women at Harvard Business School. I am 51, so I just, uh, this has been about the span of my life. Uh, and I was born to my mother when she was 19 years old. Uh, my mother wanted to be a doctor. Uh, but in her generation of women, uh, you know, you found a great man and there was an arranged marriage and uh, it was something that she very happily said, I'm going to set aside because I found a great man. Uh, she was a great mom. Uh, I, every day till today, cherish the fact that my mother did everything she did to not pursue her career dreams and she was very happy. I don't think she ever asked herself the question, uh, except every now and then, uh, about why she didn't choose to pursue her dream to be a doctor. Uh, by the time I, at the midpoint of this entire time, uh, I met my wife and uh, we were getting married and I still remember this meeting with my mother-in-law who like my mother had also set aside her own professional ambition. Uh, and she said to me and uh, she said, I have just one thing to apologize to you for. I never taught my daughter how to cook. I said, don't worry, I do all the cooking. <laughs> and I still do. <laughs> I 
But my wife, Monica, is an MBA, and uh, she has had a professional career her entire life, and we have found a way, uh, as Cheryl and so many others talked about, of uh, being able to do it, about feeling like we could do it all. We, could, we have two wonderful daughters. Uh, they're 18 and 16. And, uh, you know, as Boris was writing his case, I was struck by the quote at the beginning of the case uh, of two alumni who were saying, what will my daughter's experience be uh, when they get into the world? Uh, I don't want my daughter's experience to be anything other than an experience that absolutely stands for everything that Cheryl said today. Whatever be their ambition, we need to create a world in which they feel that they have the right to have any ambition they want to have that the world will allow them to lean in. They won't be feeling pushed out or have to opt out. They can do whatever they want to do. Because I have been lucky to enjoy the same life. I came as a minority to Harvard Business School. If someone had told me someday that I would be dean of Harvard Business School, it would have been the most impossible dream for me. If you asked me to say, double down on any dream that you had, I could never have gotten myself <laughs> to the place where I could have been dean of Harvard Business School. But it happened, and it can happen, and that's the possibility that we have to create for every human being in this world, man or woman. Whatever be their nationality, whatever be their creed. Uh, Robin once asked me before a conference that she was organizing, uh, so Nathan, can I announce to people that you're a feminist? <laughs> I said, sure, I don't know what that means, but you know, you can. <laughs> You can tell people I'm a feminist if, that, if, 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 you know, if I understand what that phrase means. And, but you know, as I was writing that to her, I was also there was a piece of me, to be honest, it sounds like a joke, but this is the point that Cheryl makes, right? I think men get uncomfortable by labels like that because you say, I don't know what this means. Is this some weird thing that I'm supposed to be about? Is it like those women in the video who said, you know, I don't know why I was announced as the women's libbers? Uh, so I don't know what it meant to say that I was going to be announced as a feminist. Still, she said, you know, I just think of you as a person who is deeply committed to the equality of men and women. And if that's the case, you're a feminist. I said, if that's what it means, sure, I'm a feminist and I'm ready to stand by and be a feminist every day of the week. So we do have... Uh, I promise you one thing, that you have my absolute undying commitment, uh, that we will do everything we can to honor this occasion of the W50 at Harvard Business School, to continue to move forward, to really be true to the mission statement that we chose for this event, which was that it was not just a celebration, but an opportunity for us to accelerate, and I want to punctuate, underline, triple underline the word accelerate, accelerate the advancement of women leaders who make a difference in the world. That is my commitment to you. That is my promise of what Harvard Business School will try and do in every way it possibly can. Now, we have three things that are very powerful at this institution that I believe we can leverage uh, in this effort to ad accelerate the advancement of women. The first is that uh, we ourselves are an organization and we ourselves should become a absolute living example of what it means to be a community where people can thrive. We have to create a culture ourselves which represents the best of these ideals. Because one thing I've learned is that people come to Harvard Business School and they don't just learn what we teach them. They imbibe the culture of the place. They learn what it means to have excellence. They learn what it means to participate in a class. They learn how to listen. They learn how to appreciate the values of other people that develop much greater appreciation for the qualities of others whom they never would have appreciated before. Yes, we closed the gender achievement gap in our grades, but we haven't closed the gender gap. There is so much more work to do. And until we become an example that is a shining example of what an organization can be in this regard, I don't think we should stop. Because this is where people learn what it means to be in a great organization. We're privileged to have amazing people who will go out and become leaders of organizations all over the world. So if they can experience it here, my hope is that they will carry a piece of that and then make their own organizations better in this regard as well. So that's the first thing and the first opportunity that we have, which is first get better ourselves. And it's too easy to get self-satisfied about that. We just have to get better. 
And I promise you, we will keep trying. It's not gonna be easy because the obvious types of discrimination that existed at Harvard Business School, we've been able to try and root out. Now it's more subtle, it's more complex. You have to figure out a way to surface it, to discuss it, to raise it. Uh, but creating a culture where these issues are discussable, where these issues can be talked about, I have learned is the single most powerful way uh, to begin to do anything about this. And we have begun that process. It's still very early days. By no means do I think we are anywhere close to where we need to be. But we have begun. And I think as you know, these famous Chinese philosophers who say these things that you inevitably have to quote, you know, every journey begins, every long journey begins with a single step. Uh, just remember, uh, every long journey does begin with a single step. And I'm very, pr you know, I think that Harvard Business School is taking its first steps in this regard. The second thing that we have an enormous power to be able to do is, uh, you know, we're an academic institution. We do research, we write cases, uh, we can convene people, just look I mean, our capacity to get people organized. And I do think we can change the conversation about how people talk about these things. We can change the conversation by doing better research. We can change the conversation by having a broader distribution of cases. Uh, of all the cases that we write today, only 9% of the cases are on women. It's easy to make excuses. Well, you know, we write cases on CEOs. If only 2% of the CEOs are women, we can't write enough cases on women. There's many, many ways, and we could change this. And I think that we have every opportunity through the intellectual muscle of the school, uh, by writing cases, by doing research. Robin organized a research conference uh, on gender. Everybody she invited came. This is a school, if you want to have a conversation, you can get the right people to come. We have changed how people think about strategy. We have changed how people th think about technology. The power of Harvard Business School to change the language of business is remarkable. Why shouldn't we as an institution also figure out how to change the language and conversation about gender? Because notice, uh, sitting right in front of me, I have the person who started this conversation. Rosabeth Mouse Cantor by writing still the single most important book that was ever written on this topic, Men and Women in the Corporation, and right, right next to her, Rava Neely, who's driving this conversation forward as well. So we can create the space, we can change the conversation, and I promise you we will make every effort to do that in our cases, uh, in our research, and in the convenings that we have. The final and the single most powerful thing that we have is uh, our alumni. 90,000 alumni all across the world, right? 12,000 women in that group. No other institution, if you just accumulated the power that we have of our alumni network across men and women, I cannot imagine an alumni group that has more capacity to change this conversation and to move this conversation forward. I don't think we've done as good a job as we need to to create a community of our alumni that are organized, feel more empowered, feel more capable of connecting with each other, of the school helping them connect with each other, of us being a resource to them at important junctures because we know that women's careers involve inevitably many more transitions. The school could be helpful at different points of these transitions. We haven't figured it out because our classic model of organizing our alumni have been to have five-year reunions. You come back every five years and that's, and it's a wonderful thing and we do it better than anybody else. <laughs> but just because we do that better than everybody else, it doesn't mean that there aren't other things that we could do to help our alumni, the single most powerful network that we have, to get better organized and better capable of doing this. I don't know what that exactly looks like today from an action standpoint. Uh, and over the course of uh, the W50 case, we've had scribes in every room and we now have hundreds and thousands of suggestions that people have come up with. You're all business people, you know that you can never act on hundreds and thousands of things. You've gotta find a way of distilling them into the three or four things that will cause great leverage. But it's very, very clear that tapping into our alumni network and organizing them differently to help make things happen here is one area of opportunity that we have, and it's one that I promise 
uh, that we will pursue. So I want to end again by, uh, by thanking the pioneers. Uh, we, we are here today because someone created this space. This meeting would not have happened without the doors that were opened by those 12 women who were part of that first class, the women who were at Radcliffe in the program before them, the many, many other women who are all in this room who each day in their own way became a role model so that someone else could say, I can be at Harvard Business School. Uh, I salute you, I thank you on behalf of everybody in this room, women all over the world, and especially as Dean of Harvard Business School. Thank you. Thank you.